welcome to the LA premiere of Bombshell. Uh, we are thrilled to have you guys here. Um, it's, it's a big day for my sister Alexandra and I. I'm the producer. Alex is the director. Um, we're going to do a Q&A afterwards. Uh, this was a challenging film to make because Hetty was a recluse for the last 40 years, 30 years of her life. Um, and so not many people survived who knew her personally. Uh, and so we'll address that and some other elements afterwards. So, oh, does this work? Yes. Great. All right. Hi, Los Angeles. I can't believe I'm here. I just got off a plane. If I say some strange things, that's why. <laughs> but um, I'm thrilled to look up and see this theater full of friends and family and people. We really want to see this film. Um, we've just come off a great week in New York. We're very excited to open this in LA at the end of the week. Um, you guys are really the only ones seeing it before that opening. And before I ever show the film, I like to find out a little bit more about the audience, get a sense for it. Because there's many different audiences that come and see a film about Hedy Lamarr. So I want to ask you, who actually knew of Hedy as the silver screen goddess in their childhood? Yeah? Algiers, Samson and Delilah. Samson and Delilah? Yeah. Desire. Ecstasy, right? Ecstasy. Ooh. She was this huge movie star. Now, there's other ways people know of her. Who knew of her as Headley? Headley? <laughs> Lisa, that's how I knew of her. I was like, who's this Headley? Why is that so hilarious? Um, what about the scandal? Anybody remember news items on her as a scandalous arrests? Yeah. Maybe a scandalous autobiography. And then, now, today, who knows of her as, or came to this film knowing of, of her primarily as the inventor and then learned everything else in the background? Not many of you. I always expect there to be more, but if that is, it's true. People know of her as many things. So that is the challenge of this film. Imagine as the filmmaker, you're thinking, I want to meet my audience where they are when the curtain comes up and the screen begins to flicker. But my audience is in all these different places. Movie star, scandal. Anyone heard of Spy? Has anyone in here heard Spy? Two, three, four, five. Yeah, Spy. Inventor. Yeah. How do you reconcile all these people? This woman was famous, like seriously famous, for all these things that don't knit together into a very coherent package. That was the that was the challenge that Adam and I faced when we started to make this film. And compounding it was this problem that this woman felt misunderstood her entire life and died pretty bitter and didn't want to tell this story in her own words. And so everyone always had to guess what connected these really different dots. And we were lucky enough to find a way to have her tell her own story uh, six months into filming. And you'll see that here. And I won't tell you any more about it. but. I hope we can discuss it a bit more in the Q&A. Just keep in mind, six months into the film, we had no way of telling it in her own voice. And then we changed it completely. We threw away the film we were making, and we let Hedy Lamarr tell her own incredible story for the first time in her own words. So without further ado. No, bombshell. Stick around afterwards, and then we'll have a party across the street at Chateau. Thank you. Thank you. Those last words that she says in that poem have been what making this film over the last three years has been about, learning this message of hers. She left it actually several times on people's answer phones, uh, her children, uh, both her children, and her friend Arlene. And I think that's interesting, right? She was definitely saying, this is my legacy. I want you to remember this poem. And that's why we had three versions to cut together and try and make the audio decent, because we were really working with those tiny little answer phone cassette tapes from 2000. And here's what's interesting. The message to me in the end is, I felt kicked in the teeth, right? I felt the world did not applaud me for my greatest achievement. And what I took away from that was Hetty saying, it was worth it anyway. So whoever is working on something where they feel that they will never be recognized, that their greatest achievements will never be seen, that they won't get the applause that they were hoping for after working so hard, her message is, when you're about to die, you'll still think, I'm glad I did it because it was in the doing it that I made a bit of a mark on the world. 
that I left something behind, and that made it worth it. Uh, should we talk a little bit about the tapes? Let's talk about the tapes. Okay, there's, uh, there's kind of a funny anecdote about these tapes. We were, as Alex mentioned before, uh, the film started six months into production, and uh, we had compiled a list of 71 people who may have interacted with Hetty uh, that were still around. Wait, let's tell them about our desperation first. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, so, no, this is the desperation. Calling, calling 71 well, that, people that and, getting, and getting nothing. <laughs> so we were, we were, let me start at desperation. Black hole, heart pounding, middle of the night, getting up like, you know when you, your work isn't going well? and you're up in the middle of the night going, I, I think this isn't gonna work. We don't have Hetty's voice here. And her voice was so critical because we were meeting with scientists who were saying to us, think about it, she almost certainly didn't do this. She was actually married to a guy who was developing these torpedoes and trying to come up with this kind of communication system. You think she didn't write down what his scientists were already saying and put it in her shoe? <coughs> and it was really a process where we had to prove to ourselves that that wasn't the case. And there was many layers to that proof. We did find out that the Germans were not working on that technology. We do know that. We do know that Hetty was inspired by that remote control that didn't come out until 1938. It's in her notebooks. So we know it's, she's working on it in Hollywood. Can't be then from the Nazis. But also, nobody had her voice responding to that allegation. And that was that critical piece that was missing. And so this is the, the point where we ended up compiling a list of anybody alive who could possibly have these tapes six months in with a kind of ridiculous hope that they existed, even though she was a recluse. And the first time we went through this list, it gave us nothing. Now, uh, the latest hits from today's hot Okay. And then six months in, it doesn't work, oh, it does, there. okay, it's back. Uh, and then six months in, we, we go through this list again, and number 35 is Fleming Meeks, and it turns out we've got the wrong email for him. We emailed him at Barron's, and he's moved, no, we emailed him at Forbes, and he's moved to Barron's. And we have the right email, we email him, and five minutes later, the phone rings, the, the number that we left. And he goes, uh, his voice on the other end goes, I've been waiting 25 years for you to call me. <laughs> I got the tapes. He has the tapes. And he's been dragging them from apartment building to apartment building. And he had them in his office. He had one in his office. And we said, you know, don't even test them. Don't tell us about them. We're going to come over there right now. And that's why it's the worst footage in the whole film, because I'm actually shooting it. Uh, <laughs> and we want to capture that moment on tape. So you've got him putting play for the first time. We didn't know if it was going to work. Yeah, so the thing with these tapes, with these cassette tapes, if you have any at home, is don't press play on them. The audio can actually physically fall off at this point. You have to take them to a pro audio house and have it baked in. Which we did machine. afterwards. Yeah, so after, you, <laughs> um, after that footage. But we did want to get him listening to them and he hadn't pressed play on them for a long time. He didn't know they were delicate. And it, it, the interesting thing was we sat down with him, right? And I said to him, talk about anything but the tapes before the cameras are rolling. And he said, uh, I live in New Jersey, but I always love Tribeca. And I go, oh, yeah, my aunt always loved Tribeca. She lives at 88 Warren. He said, who's your aunt? I said, Jean Hollibird. He said, oh, she's one of my best friends. She was in his wedding, and every week they would meet for martinis uh, at the Odeon. Yep. And had she just mentioned the fact that her nephew and niece were working on a Hattie Lamar documentary, it would have saved us a lot of so money, heartache, <laughs> trouble. Uh, we forgave her, but it took a while. She's not invited to no, now we go drinking with them both. It's very bizarre. But it was literally in our backyard. You know, there were the, those tapes that we hoped existed in the world were there. And when I finally got the big tapes back and put them in, they'd been wound to a random place. And I kid you not, I press play, and it's Hetty's voice saying, you know, I think I'm going to be able to control people after my death. <laughs> Having just had this weird experience with the tapes, I'm like, yeah, I think you might be able to. It's possible. No, that was... That's the tape. That was the game changer Next, for we, this movie we for us. Threw away the film we were making, uh, which was painful for Adam. He's on the finance side, and it was exhilarating for me. And um, that was exhilarating for you too, I think. And we started again, and we let Hetty tell her story in her own words. Uh, so we're up to some questions. Uh, as a 
fellow film historian, I'd like to congratulate you on doing such a wonderful job. And I, Thank I, you. I believe that Algiers was written at least in part by John Howard Lawson, and it was just the 70th anniversary of when he was the first member of the Hollywood 10 to testify before the House on American Activities Committee. Oh, is that right? And so it's I, historic. My question to you is, what was Susan Sarandon's role in the film? What was Susan Sarandon's role in the film? Susan Sarandon is an executive producer on this film, and also she gave us her loft to work out of. We did. We were homeless. And we were officeless. Yeah. We were officeless, and she, her loft is actually the home she brought up her three children in, and uh, and she gave it to us to work in, and it was extremely valuable for us. Anybody else? Yes. How did you first get interested in Hedy Lamar and want to make this film? How did I first get interested in Hedy Lamar and want to make this film? Well, I have been doing a series on inventors for Bloomberg Television, and it's what we call a deep dive in journalism. I got to really interview everybody alive that I thought was an interesting inventor. And what that did was sort of create for me a, a picture of this world of invention. How do we recognize inventors? How do they create our world? What are the obstacles they face? And some of the obstacles that were really obvious was that anyone who wasn't a certain type of person, and I think you know who I mean, uh, would go to Silicon Valley with their ideas and not be taken seriously. So I was talking to a lot of people who had brilliant ideas, who had really struggled, and I was thinking a lot about how that happens. Why do we think our world was invented by one kind of person? Why is everyone in our canon basically one kind of person? And it was what I realized was a, it was a hidden figures question, but we didn't have that film yet. Yeah, it's in that vein, right? And uh, we started Reframe Pictures, and our mission was to reframe the conversation around these sticky issues. And uh, our development producer gave me Hetty's Folly by Richard Rhodes. And we read it, and it was like, there it is. Perfect. Yeah. Best untold story we've come across. Ever. So. I mean, and then how can you not make it, right? And Alexandra's actually probably a hidden figure in her own right. You know, she's this beautiful woman who's went to. Harvard, Oxford, Columbus. She's so smart. She doesn't. You don't. You don't look at her and go, "Wow, that's an incredible director," or "Wow, that's you know one of the smartest people I've ever met." He's saying I look and like a dumb dumb. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a special guest. We've got Hetty's son here, Anthony Loader. She really cemented my mother's legacy in in film, basically. And um, the thing about Alex is, I mean, I've seen this 20 times, and I, I never tire of it because it's so well crafted, and it's um, so moving, and it's so well. It's like. I mean, Alex walked into a storm of, of data and information, and, and she crafted, like, I mean, she all these pearls everywhere, and she strung them together and put the sound on and the move, the emotion, and the facts, and the reality. And I couldn't, you know, four or five years ago or four years ago when, when she called me to say she wanted to do this, I, you know, after talking with her for a while, I liked her right away. But I'm so happy that she did this because no one else could have done it like this. It, I mean, thank you. That means a lot to I me. Mean, and can we keep you up here for a minute? Because I think other people might want to ask you oh. questions. Do we have any other questions? Would anyone like to ask me or Adam or anything? They're brother and sister, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. why. You couldn't tell the sibling relationship. Are there any institutions in Vienna that honor your mother or anything worldwide? Yeah, uh, there's uh, on her birthday, November 9th, it's a World Inventors Day, and they have a Hedy Lamarr Prize. And the whole thing was created uh, by Hedy. Like years ago, I went there, uh, uh, she got the Kaplan Medal, which is they give to uh, people who contribute something. 
and all the military use this. If you're walking around in a hospital and you have, I mean, this this invention goes on and on and on and on. It's a yeah. grave as well. Oh yeah, the grave. So we oh. yeah, we worked with Anthony to fund a. a yeah. A grave, a tomb of honor in Vienna. Yeah, Susan she didn't have a the... tomb of honor, and we wanted her to be buried in state in this beautiful, famous graveyard in Vienna. And the the tombstone is really cool. It's 88 rods with 88 balls with 88 frequencies that she invented. But when you walk up to it, uh, it shifts and resolves into her face. Mm. Well, Susan Sarandon, by the way, she helped you know, raise the money to pay for that. And uh, she also helped these two here with her input. She's a very intelligent woman and very creative. And uh, she, she every now and then, you know, watching what Alex made, she'd say something and move the film in, in a certain direction. Uh, Any, anyone in the audience feeling mixed about Susan Sarandon this week? I, I, I will tell you. I will, I, let me address that oh, because this, I think I've been getting a lot of mail about Susan this week. Um, what I say to people is, look, my politics and Susan's don't line up. We have many amazing conversations about that. Uh, we really spar. I'm a real feminist, as you can tell from this film. And uh, obviously, my preference for president did not line up with hers. But I really believe that we need to, as a culture, learn to accept complicated women. Complicated, multifaceted, sometimes dark, sometimes difficult to understand. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be putting this woman on the screen. She had so much to say, and so few people were willing to listen to her. And I want to say, you know, we can all have our feelings about Susan's politics. You know, some of us might really line up with her in this room, but some of us might be really angry at her. But we also have to let her be Susan. She also pulls people out of cold waters on Christmas Day because she believes in bringing attention to the refugee crisis. She did that on Lesbos last year. So, you know, you 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 got to look at her and go multifaceted, complicated, difficult, and not let our culture just rip her down because we don't like complicated women. beautiful woman in the world. Millions of people loved uh, my mother, and my mother was never loved. So, um, but the Austrians offered her to go home, right? Several but, times. But she didn't want to go because I think she didn't want to be seen the way she looked. That's what I think. She, because she was... She, she turned them down three times. She, she was like, I mean, she got a raw deal. I mean, she didn't have a real close friend to keep her feet on the ground. She actually did go back to uh, Vienna during, uh, for her honeymoon with Howard Lee, and apparently she spent the whole time crying, because uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Vienna had changed so much, it wasn't what she remembered it as. Also, she had, to, she had to confront this person that she was pretending she wasn't, right? She'd lost all these people in the Holocaust, and she never told anybody. So you can imagine she's walking around this city of ghosts, <laughs> And she can't even tell her husband who she's lying to. Why she's so upset. Yep. Um, I got a question uh, that is kind of business, but also creative. In the beginning of the film, you note that she was on contract at MGM. Was she at MGM the entire time, less than two features that she produced independently? And what was it like for rights and clearances at this point? <laughs> tough, tough. But Warner Brothers owns it. Does anyone? know about Warner Brothers and rights and clearances. They just give you the footage. No, it's extremely expensive. Right. <laughs> that was the most expensive part of them. Um, but no, it was, it was Louis B. Mayer. She was, uh, yeah, she was with MGM for seven years? She was, yes. And then she did her own films, and then she was with Paramount for Samson and Delilah, but and Al two others, right? And Algiers was the first film, her big film, she was lent out. Yeah. 
And she kind of orchestrated that herself. That's right. She also wanted to do Casablanca, but they they wouldn't let her. Uh, they said they had another film that they needed her to do. She didn't have any choice. She, they, they said, we're making this movie and you're playing this part. And so he, she was very unhappy about all of that part. And, you know, I wonder what would have happened if she did go to Washington, D.C. and look at the patents and try to improve them to help win the war. She wanted to, I should explain Anthony, that she really wanted to go to Washington and she was writing to, to she was writing to uh, George Antal saying I need to offer my services to the patent office and just tell them what I know about the weaponry. And they never took her seriously. Should we take one more question and then? Yeah, so right in the back. Um, I have a personal favorite of your mom's films. I was wondering what, what yours is. Mine? Yeah. My favorite is uh, Come Live With Me with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, because that's the how I remember my mother was the best. That's the closest she is to being real. I, my mother went through a lot of phases and uh, many lives. And um, you know, one thing about Alex, the director here, she made a movie and she trashed it and started all over again. And she never stopped digging and digging and digging like a dog digging for a bone <laughs> until she came up with uh, Fleming Meek's tapes. And that was the string that pulled all these pearls together. Andrea, and I've never been flattered to be called a dog before. <laughs> she, she's a beautiful dog. <laughs> and she's very, intelli she's very intelligent as well. Um. I love them both dearly, and Thank I'm you. so happy she did this. Thanks. And my mother would be so happy that she did this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I let everyone go, you have to know how important you are to this LA opening. You are the people whose words are going to be heard by everybody else right now. So whatever you think of the film, please go out and put it out on social media, Rotten Tomatoes, IMDb. This is your moment. It will totally impact our opening. We had some screenings like this in New York. It totally impacted the New York opening. So please say what you think. Be honest. Um, and also come and join us over at Chateau Marmont for a party. So Thank, you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I got to say one last thing. For me, this was a beautiful ride. Alex just, the, the film started. You're on this journey. She lifts you off. You fly for an hour and a half. She lets you down gently. And you know all about it. And it was so well crafted, so beautiful. Bravo!